Welcome to the Boxing Gossip Channel. Please hit subscribe if you are new. As always, thanks for tuning in. This video is a Patreon request from Connor. So first and foremost, I want to thank Connor for his continued support via Patreon. It makes a real difference. Connor's request was for me to discuss the top pound-for-pound -pound fighters in Great Britain, um, including a top 10 list. Now, I've done something similar. Uh, I don't have an exact date, but I did something similar uh, second half of 2018, certainly. Um, but subsequent to that video, obviously, a lot of the fighters on the list have been out. Some of them have won. Some of them have been unsuccessful. Uh, and there's been possibly a few changes to the order. It's always a topic people find interesting, so uh, perhaps makes sense to revisit it in the new year, especially seeing as we've had a request on the topic. Um, now, when I do updates to these lists, one of the things I don't do is go back to the first list I created and simply replicate that, um, you know, adding and subtracting people who've won and lost, etc. Uh, I kind of start each list from scratch as if there's no history. And I am always open-minded to changing my opinion. You know, I don't, I'm not someone who has a set opinion on things and then completely sticks to that and won't derogate from it, whatever the circumstances. So whilst you will obviously see some of the same names and faces propping up again, there may be one or two um, differences. And there were one or two particular areas that I remember getting a little bit of stick for in the comments section to my previous list about fighters included and potentially fighters not included as well that maybe we'll address over the course of this video. Um, but first and foremost, as always, before I start one of these videos, I'm going to go through a few notable omissions. We're going to rattle through them. Also going to say, and I won't labour this point because long-time viewers will hear me say it before, for me, when you're doing lists of this nature, talking about the top 10 pound for pound in Britain, I'm going to be looking at resume. You know, I'm not one of these people who focuses on a prospect who's looked absolutely devastating, knocked out a load of people, um, you know, and, and, and sort of um, not been in against very much, not had many questions asked to them. So without any spoilers, you're not going to see any Daniel Dubois just yet on the list. It's not about eye tests for me, it's about resume. But anyway, let's put that to one side. Notable omissions. Amir Khan and Tyson Fury, two guys who at their peak would be towards the top of this list. Two guys who can very easily get back to this list if they get active and have form at a noteworthy level. At present, they're both inactive. I appreciate Khan has a fight coming up, but it's been so long since they had a notable win in the sport of boxing that I've decided to omit both of those guys. Um, James DeGale. Notable omission. He was high on my list last time out. He comes off. Frankly, if you're losing to Caleb Truax, Truax won that fight easily, in my opinion. He won it by a margin. Um, if you're losing to Caleb Truax, you're not one of the top 10 fighters in Great Britain. So, James DeGale uh, off the list. Terry Flanagan still doesn't make the grade. Uh, he just hasn't fought a level of opposition throughout his career at all. I do not believe Terry Flanagan has ever fought a top five division in any uh, a top five fighter in any division. And the fact he's a long reigning world champion is kind of by the by. His resume is just painfully weak. So Flanagan's not on the list. Uh, and finally, Eubank. Eubank would probably be my number eleven. Um, I think he's the one who's most likely to enter this list. But right now, if we're looking at Eubank's best wins. Arthur Abraham, you know, maybe that sort of level of opponent, they're just not quite the high enough statue in, in their respective divisions uh, in order to merit inclusion in the top 10. So those are a few notable omissions. Without further ado, let's crack on to the top 10. And number 10 is someone I received a lot of stick for omitting in my last video, and that's Tony Bellew. You know, I have developed a slight reputation as being anti-Tony Bellew, and I will admit that I don't appreciate his style and have been guilty year on year on year for undervaluing him in fights and for underestimating him. So maybe I've deserved some of the stick, and I can't deny it. Bellew has you know, consistently overperformed and consistently done better against fighters than I have expected him to. So you know, real credit goes to Tony Bellew. Uh, for the way he's handled himself over the course of his career. And for me, he probably does deserve to be in the British pound-for-pound pound top 10. With James DeGale off the list, the space is open for Tony Bellew. Um, Bellew, has he beaten top 10 fighters? 
well, yes. You know, he's beaten uh, Ilunga Makabu at cruiserweight. He's obviously beaten David Hay at heavyweight. The difficulty with Tony Bellew is at no stage can you say Tony Bellew has really beaten an elite fighter or Tony Bellew has beaten a fighter who is the, you know, the top of the heavyweight division or the top of the cruiserweight division. We certainly didn't see him in with the likes of Usyk or Bredis or, you know, Gassiev when he was at cruiserweight. The only time he fought uh, elite light heavyweight in Adonis Stevenson, he lost. Um, but, you know, he's got form there and thereabouts cleverly. Hay, Flores, Macabu. Um, one or two other bits of form as well over McKenzie. So let's include Tony Bellew at number 10. Uh, I think he deserves inclusion based on his consistency and um, good luck to him. So Bellew at number 10. Uh, number 9, I have Kaliafai. Um, Kaliafai, I think I probably said this last time I did one of these videos, a guy who in terms of skills, in terms of technique, in terms of attributes, could possibly be a lot hard, higher than number 9. But at this stage of his career... He just doesn't have the resume to justify that. Lewis Concepcion, good name at Superfly, who he's beaten. Subsequent wins over Muranaka and Asida mean that he has stayed at that consistent level. Like Tony Bellew, for me, he hasn't taken on the very, very top fighters in his division. And as a result, it's harder to have him any higher than number nine. He's a guy who needs a big year for me. Talk about him fighting Charlie Edwards. Oh, I don't want to see that. I want to see him fighting... Uh, you know, the consensus higher rated guys in his division. But Kaliafai, uh, a current world champion, and a world champion who, whilst he's got less defences than a guy like Terry Flanagan, for me, a name like Lewis Concepcion is probably more of a relevant name in, um, uh, you know, the super flyweight division than anyone uh, Terry Flanagan's ever beaten. I mean, Terry Flanagan's best win, is it Derry Matthews? Is it... Um, it's probably Petr Petrov, isn't it? You know, so there you go. Anyway, moving on. Number eight, Lee Selby. Selby's another one of these guys. He's been on the scene for a long time. He feels like he's been one of our top fighters, you know, top for ages. And if you were doing this list without focusing on resume, I couldn't argue if you had Selby as number one. You know, Selby is a, a great fighter to watch. He's not the most exciting in terms of power punches and getting sucked into walls, but he's a pretty complete technician. He's a you know, really, really, really advanced boxer with ultimate smoothness in there. But again, it comes down to who is Selby's best win. You know, he's got a big fight up against Josh Warrington. I appreciate that would be his best known win if he's successful, but is Josh Warrington really the world class or the elite? No. I mean, for me, Selby's best win is uh, Evgeny Gradovitz. And, you know, Gradovitz hasn't exactly... Um, bounce back from that loss to prove that he's he's still a, a world-class fighter subsequently you know so it's kind of hard to sum up Lee Selby there's been a few less inspiring performances he's been in with the likes of uh, Eric Hunter uh, Jonathan Barros Fernando Montiel Joel Brunker I think he is there or there about but really that number 10 9 and 8 Selby Kalia Fai, Tony Bellew, there isn't a huge amount in it between them. Uh, you know, Bellew's probably got more, well, Bellew's got more highly publicised losses, but you could, I couldn't really argue whatever order you have those three, and they're all guys who've been there or thereabouts without taking on the true elite of their divisions, and you know, if they want to be higher, they'll have to uh, step up. Number seven, Kel Brook. Now, Kel Brook isn't higher than seven because of the losses, you know, especially the fact he's got back-to-back -back losses against the likes of Gennady Golovkin and against the likes of Errol Spence. So, Kel Brook, I have to put him at number seven. I can't put him much higher because of those losses. Obviously, comeback fight due up against Ravchenko, uh, so we'll see how he gets on there. Um, Kel Brook is the opposite of the likes of Selby and Kalia Fight in that he has already stepped into the ring with the world-class opponents several times. His biggest win, Sean Porter. Still a very, very good win. Could be argued that he beat Sean Porter uh, better than Keith Furman did, let's put it that way. You know, Kel Brook very much still deserves to be in the conversation. Um, losses to Errol Spence and Triple G, both by knockout, have obviously put a lot of questions over his future in the game. Um, but if he's able to replicate the form he showed in the first half of that Errol Spence fight, he's still a fighter to be reckoned with, and he's still someone who can continue to uh, stay on this list and maybe improve his place from number seven. Number six, Jamie McDonnell. 
really, really hard guy to sum up because it feels like he's been inconsistent of late and it really feels like he's lost the momentum he had in his career a few years ago. He's now 31. He's had two back-to-back -back disappointing fights against Laborio Solis, although he didn't take a loss in either of those. Um, and he kind of maintains his place on the list largely due to his 2015 where he had back-to-back -back wins against the then unbeaten Tomoki Kamida, which was considered pretty world-class form at the time. Uh, McDonald's a hard guy to sum up. You kind of feel like this is make or break for him in his career. Is he going to go on a real upwards trajectory? Or, um, you know, he's talk about him changing weight classes, for example. Or have we seen the best of him? And is he someone like James DeGale who may start to slide off this list? But right now, I keep McDonald where he is, number six in the list. Number five, I have Ryan Burnett. Um, Burnett. Still early in his career, 18-0, but a unified world champion beating Lee Haskins and Zanat Zakianov. I think when I did it last time round, I had him at number 6 because I had De Gale above him. And people gave me sick for putting him at number 6. They thought he should be a lot higher being a unified champion. Now, whilst I can see some logic behind that, the difficulty is, is in becoming unified world champion, he's yet to beat the very, very top of his division. And guys like Lewis Neary... Guys like Zalani, Tetti, guys like Jamie McDonald, who we've already referenced, uh, Yamanaka. Um, these guys are out there, and these guys are yet to fight, yet to step in the ring with uh, Ryan Burnett. He's beaten pretty decent names. Uh, Zaki Arnov was a decent name. Uh, Lee Haskins was a, a decent fighter. And, you know, you could say these are world-class wins, but they're not the very top of the division. So, because of that... I've got Ryan Burnett at number five. But to be number five pound for pound in your country when you've had 18 fights uh, is pretty impressive stuff. And he's someone who can clearly go a lot higher if he continues winning. Number four, George Groves. Now, George Groves is always a difficult guy to rank because people always um, know George Groves maybe more for his losses than his wins. Um, in particular, the two Carl Frotz losses, which will live long in the memory for obvious reasons. Um, George Groves has actually built a very formidable resume outside of the Carl Frost fights. And he also had the loss to Badu Jack, let's not forget. But recently he's shown very much improved form. Stopping Fedor Tudinov, stopping Jamie Cox. He's got other form, if you look historically on his resume. Who can forget the win over James DeGale when DeGale was unbeaten? Um, admittedly in a very tight fight. Paul Smith... Um, Andrea De Luisa, he beat. Um, there's more names than that as well. You know, Groves has beaten a few decent fighters over the years. Uh, I'm not instantly uh, getting more names coming to my head, but if I box wrecked him, I would do, because I've seen a lot of his fights over the years. And I think George Groves, um, because of his consistency and because of the fact he's coming off two back-to-back -back knockout wins, deserves to be where he is on the list. Um, Groves, obviously, fighting Eubank in a fortnight, that's going to be a big test. If he goes and beats Eubank... Uh, it's very impressive. If Eubank beats Groves, perhaps we'll be talking Eubank in the top five. And, you know, perhaps George Groves, like his old foe James DeGale, will be slipping off the list. But right now, I just felt that George Groves had been involved in higher level elite fights than um, the likes of a Jamie McDonnell or than the likes of a Ryan Burnett. I appreciate they may not necessarily be unification fights, but I believe George Groves has fought the elite of his division um, probably four times four times already and you know I think in fighting Chris Eubank he's uh, adding to that as well so let, let's see how it plays out and let's see where George Groves ends up we're into the top three number three Carl Frampton Carl Frampton's last performance um, I've actually forgotten the guy's name might have been was it Garcia? Let me box her. Um, yeah, Horatio Garcia. It was a very uninspiring performance that left kind of more questions than answers. But prior to that, he beat Scott Quigg, uh, he beat Leo Santa Cruz, and then he had the majority decision loss to Leo Santa Cruz. Earlier on in his career, he'd beaten names like Kiko Martinez. Um, and, you know, clearly Frampton is a guy who's been in and around this top 10 pound for pound list for, for some time. Now 30 years old. Uh, stepping in against Nanito Denaire, another even more aging warrior in April. Um, it's kind of a time for Carl Frampton where you suspect the big fights for him are going to happen this year or next year, and then his career will start to wind down. 
beating a name like Nanito Denaire, even though Denaire's coming into the author of his career, is still representing a decent level of form. Um, and I think Frampton, despite the loss to Leo Santa Cruz, retains his place in the top three. If you're going to mix it in that elite so consistently, um, you know, fights are going to go either way. And I think the nature of that loss and the fact it was following on from a good win means that Carl Frampton, uh, you know, is still number three. Number two, someone who's jumped up the list absolutely massively, Billy Joe Saunders. And I believe Billy Joe Saunders has um, one of the most underrated resumes in British boxing. Now, people may take a look at this and say, Billy Joe Saunders hasn't fought the elite of his division. You know, he hasn't fought Canelo. He hasn't fought Golovkin. And I can't dispute that. These are facts. These aren't opinions. But what I can say is, in my opinion, Billy Joe Saunders has fought and beat several fighters um, who are just one gap below that. Um, let's not forget the streak of undefeated fighters he took on. But for me, the wins against David Lemieux, Andy Lee... Chris Eubank Jr., those are all wins that upon reflection have looked very, very, very good. I believe that now Chris Eubank Jr. represents a world-class fighter. Um, I believe that David Lemieux, whilst not world-class, would probably be a consensus top five or six middleweight. Um, and I believe you could say the same probably for Andy Lee at the time of that fight. He also had the huge streak of taking um, you know, undefeated records. Jared Fletcher, Emmanuel Blandamura... John Ryder, Spike O'Sullivan, Nick Blackwell. And if you look back at Billy Joe Saunders' resume, it's actually surprising how many names are well-known names who've been a feature of the, the boxing scene for a while. Um, the consistency of Billy Joe Saunders' resume, the fact that it's been you know, good fight after good fight, maybe not always good fight in terms of entertainment, but I think he's fought a decent level of opposition. Willie Monroe Jr., again last year, uh, you know, I think Billy Joe deserves to be number two in the list. And I think when he's fought the top guys, like he did against David Lemieux, he's raised his game and showed a level of dominance at that sort of level. So I have Billy Joe Saunders at number two. Uh, and at number one, you can probably guess who number one is because uh, I haven't referenced him so far in the video. It's Anthony Joshua. Now, Joshua is a maybe an unpopular pick because it may be seen as a casual pick. But put frankly, Joshua is the only guy... In Britain, who I can say is the definite consensus number one in his division. Now, I'm not saying every single person out there believes Anthony Joshua is the number one. But I'm saying if you asked a thousand boxing fans who is the number one heavyweight in the world, I am sure uh, over 500 would say Anthony Joshua. Whereas if you did that in the other divisions, I'm not sure people would be saying Ryan Burnett. I'm not sure people would be saying Billy Joe Saunders. I'm not sure people would be saying Lee Selby. You know, Joshua, for me, is the consensus number one. He is also, I believe, the only fighter in Britain who has gone out and beaten the person who would be considered the consensus number one in their division when he beat Vladimir Klitschko. Um, now, obviously, Tyson Fury had beaten Vladimir Klitschko, but Tyson Fury wasn't active. So with Fury's absence... I think Vladimir Klitschko would definitely have been the consensus number one heavyweight at the time that Joshua beat him. So I really do think Joshua deserves to be the number one pound for pound fighter. He is the person who um, has the highest claim. And really, whatever you want to say about Joshua, he's been very, very well tested for what is essentially still a young pro career. Been in with... Um, uh, with Klitschko, obviously, he's actually fought a decent level of opposition otherwise. You know, Dillian White is a top 10 heavyweight, um, and he's beaten Dillian White. Carlos Takam is a borderline top 10 heavyweight, and he's beaten Carlos Takam. He's beaten Dominic Brazil, who's probably just below the top 10. And let's not forget, in his very next fight, he's fighting a definite top 5 level heavyweight in uh, Joseph Parker. So, Joshua has been well tested for this early stage in his career. He is the man at heavyweight. There's no one else in Britain we can say is the man at their respective weight division. He's not only the man, but he's the man who's beaten the other number one. Uh, clearly, when Fury comes back, that will be a great conversation to have. Um, but let's wait to see what Tyson does first. So, there's my top 10. Uh, that's my top 10 pound for pound list. These lists are always going to create opinion because when you're doing a top 10 list, it's pretty impossible that someone will agree with you at every step along the way um but that's my take on it uh you know that's my best bet on it and holding what i value in terms of doing these lists i think that's the right set of people at this stage let me know your thoughts guys if you've enjoyed the content um 
do leave a comment in the section below. If you're new or you haven't done so before, please press subscribe. And as always, take the time to hit the thumbs up button. It would be appreciated. Thanks for tuning in.